Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub. And uh, if you watch L'Chaim regularly, you know that very special people tend to join me at this table. And I love introducing them to you. But this edition of the Chaim is special to me in a very different way. There's a very personal dimension to this program. For I'm being joined by a man with whom I've had a very special personal relationship with, a friendship with, for more than 40 years. And I must say at the outset, this edition of the Chaim will have special meaning to you if you're a baseball fan. And if you are a baseball fan, no matter which team you root for, you well know this iconic call. Swung on and driven a deep right. It is high. It is far. It is gone. Ball game over. Yankees win. The Yankees win. There are baseball fans all over America of all ages who try to imitate that home run call. And they know the man whose voice has become a national staple in the world of American sports, John Sterling, who for more than 25 years has been the voice of the New York Yankees, creating his own unique style of baseball play-by-play -play and becoming one of the legendary baseball announcers for fans of more than a generation. And John Sterling, what a, what a fabulous kick this is for me to have you sitting with me. And you know, I've loved you for years and years and years, and now you're at this table. I thank you so very much, and, and, and you have to be patient with me. Uh, on this edition of L'Chaim, I need a moment to explain why it's so important to me to have you here and at, at this table. And many of you who have been watching me and L'Chaim for years Know how, you know some of my personal story, and you know that in addition to my wife, Ruth, and our extraordinary five children, all children are extraordinary. I'm sure your children and your grandchildren are extraordinary. But for me, my children and my grandson, Aaron, they're out of this world. And I've really been blessed with a family whom I adore. But after my family, my greatest love is all things Jewish. And I love teaching Midrash and the genius of the Jewish tradition and about the Jewish people in the state of Israel. And I love JBS Shalom TV. And after my family and all things Jewish, I have two other loves, theater and baseball, softball. And again, if you're a frequent viewer of L'Chaim, you've heard me talk about the enormous influence Jackie Robinson had on me as a Jew growing up as a child in the 1950s. You may have seen my meeting with his widow, Rachel Robinson, and many of you wrote me such moving emails after that program describing how many of you were also influenced by Jackie Robinson. And you know I grew up a huge Brooklyn Dodger fan. And in the 1950s, baseball was just beginning to be seen on television, small black and white TVs. And if you lived in New York City, you could watch the Dodgers on Channel 9 and the Giants and Yankees shared Channel 11. But baseball was still in its infancy on television in the 1950s. And most of the time, we listened to baseball on the radio, often on transistor radios, which we could carry around with us or take to bed with us. And the people who brought us baseball the Dodgers or the Giants or the Yankees or whichever team you followed, the Cincinnati Reds if you were from Ohio. They were the baseball announcers, the play-by-play -play guys. And we experienced the game of baseball through their voices. The sound of the game was much more than the crack of the bat and the roar of the crowd. Baseball was the cadence and the melody and the descriptions provided by the men at the microphone often faceless voices that became our intimate friends. 
They were the conduit through which we all experienced and loved the game of baseball. So as a child, I'm listening to Red Barber and Connie Desmond and this young kid, Vince Scully, and they would bring me the Brooklyn Dodgers into my kitchen, into my bedroom. And if there was a day game, the first thing I'd do when I came home from school was turn on the radio and hear that wonderful sound, the sound of baseball on radio and their voices giving me the details of my beloved Dodgers. And then there was Russ Hodges with the New York Giants and the forever call when Bobby Thompson crushed baseball hearts with his shot heard around the world to defeat the Dodgers in that fateful playoff game of 1951. And then there were the hated New York Yankees. Oh, if you were a Dodger fan in the 1950s, in love with the integrated, blue-collar group of fabulous ballplayers whom you felt you could be best friends with if you ever met them on the streets of Brooklyn. If you were a Dodger fan, you hated the pure white, aristocratic, non-Jewishy Yankees who always came out on top of the Dodgers in the World Series, World Series after World Series, except for that glorious series of 55. But if you hated the Yankees, you still admired, you even loved the voice of the New York Yankees. Mel Allen, going, going, going. How about that? Who also seemed to be the nicest guy you'd ever want to meet. And later in my life, I got to meet Mel Allen. And he even announced my name. Which brings me to the story of my 40-year friendship with this very special man. So I become a rabbi in 1972. I'm the rabbi of a wonderful weekend chavura in Stanford, Connecticut, where I am to this day. And I also am invited by the president of WMC Radio in New York City, R. Peter Strauss, an amazing human being, to become the editorial director and the director of public affairs for WMCA Radio. Peter Strauss knew my work from, during rabbinical school from uh, my working as the assistant editor of Shema magazine, a creation of my rabbinic mentor, Dr. Eugene B. Borowitz. And in the 1970s, WMCA was a pioneer in telephone talk radio. And I was a big fan of talk radio. And the opportunity to work in professional radio alongside some of the biggest radio personalities, Barry Gray, Bob Grant, later on Barry Farber, and to be writing editorials in the Nixon years. I mean, it was just too good to be true. And so for seven years, I experienced and I learned and I wrote and had this extraordinary opportunity to become proficient in professional talk radio, which then led to my radio work with L'Chaim and then moved to television and ultimately has led to JBS Shalom TV. And that's my professional journey in a nutshell. But there was one more wonderful outgrowth of my years at WMCA. I became friends with this wildly talented young sports talk host who did a nightly show of his own on WMCA, John Sterling. And John and I became friends, and we shared a love of baseball and softball. And when I had this idea of creating a promotional softball team for WMCA, and I became the manager of the, the WMCA No Stars, most of the on-air talent at WMCA were hardly softball players, except for the captain of the team, <laughs> the shortstop, left-handed though he was, and the number three power hitter for me, John Sterling. And John, I don't know what photographs you have of the WMCA no stars, but for any of you who know John Sterling, Here's what he looked like back in the 1970s. Oh, my God. With the WMCA No Stars. Here's the whole team, by the way. There you are. Bob Grant's in the front row. You're standing next to Malachi McCourt. Bring back oh, some yeah. memories. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. What marvelous memories. And, by the way, this is John Sterling, power hitter number three from the left side. Needed a haircut. <laughs> Uh, that's the way you wear your hair. And even in 1973, we won a tournament or two. <laughs> and the No Stars was not the only team on which John and I played softball together. I also had a softball team in the Bronx, which I called the Four Corners. 
because players came from the four corners of the region to play on this team, and because it was a Jewish reference to the Arba Kanfot, the four-cornered garment traditional Jews wear. And the pitcher and number three hitter on the four corners was John Sterling, <laughs> playing for me on the four corners. And as I said, John and I became friends, and I knew his dream was to do play-by-play -play baseball. And I'd travel with John to games around the city where we would, he would be the guest announcer or do play-by-play -play during Yankee old-timer games when Phil Rizzuto was down on the field and Bill White was down on the field and John would be filling in and I'd be sitting next to him, snapping pictures of him with the microphone. And so I was not surprised that John became a play-by-play -play announcer for the Atlanta Braves he also did play-by-play -play for the Atlanta Hawks. John was a superb basketball and hockey play-by-play -play announcer. For years, he was the voice of the New York, New Jersey Nets of the old ABA when Dr. J was revolutionizing the game of basketball and winning ABA championships. And John was also the voice of the New York Islanders hockey team. And then in 1989, John Sterling would be offered <coughs> his dream job and would become the play-by-play -play announcer for the New York Yankees. And for more than 25 years, John Sterling has never missed calling a single Yankee game. That's extraordinary. One of my great professional friendships has been with John Sterling, who's cared for me and helped me in the most special of ways when I've had to deal with some medical issues. And so I hope you can all appreciate what a very special edition of Ochaim this is for me to be able to welcome to this table an amazing announcer and a, a more amazing human being, John Sterling. Thank you so much. There you go. Well, I don't, can't live up to that, but thank you very much. No, you do. Two things yep. I want to do at the beginning. Okay. Now, I'm not hearing the production, so you may do this at the beginning, but you should be using as a theme um, Jerry Herman's Ochaim. <laughs> to life, to life, Lakayam, 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 to life. Anyway, now I've ruined that song. No, uh, by the way, you and I do share a love of mu oh, Broadway music. Oh, absolutely. And you'll even bring that into an actual baseball broadcast. All the time. Which is one of your unique All the time. styles. The late Marvin Hamlish once said to me, he's a big fan, and a, and a dear, sweet human being, as well as being ultra-talented, but he once said to me, John, you're not using the Broadway reference songs as much. <laughs> It's because who I was working with, and now that's changed. Now I'm working with a, a Broadway actress in, in Susan Waldman. Now, one thing you didn't tell them, please, is that during the MCA days, when there would be a tape on, um, and I had to sit there, wait for this to end, and begin my show, that we would warm up in the hallways. I can't believe you remember that. Yeah. Well, that's pretty unusual. It is. But what John was saying is, John was the pitcher on the four corners. Right. And there was a long hallway, and you and I would get, go out in that hallway, and you'd practice right. pitching to me. Take some to the mid, as they say, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you ha and you remember that. That's so and sweet. I, I, yeah. I, I didn't know if I should put it in. I am so glad you mentioned it. Well, there are things, Marcus, you know, you remember in life, and then things you forget, too. But that certainly is a great memory, and I, I loved it. And yeah, WMCA was a um, most unusual radio station. It was. We had tremendous freedom, and everyone did their own show. Grant and Malky McCourt and Long John Neville and Barry Gray. We had some, some group. It was, it was great. In yes. The, and it was in the 70s, and it just was a very different time. Yep. All right, I, I want to first talk a little bit about you, and then I want to talk about the work you do. Okay. okay. Anything you want. Okay. So, you know, you heard me talk a little bit about my own background and how baseball and the love of the game was part of me since I was five and six years old. When does the love of sports begin for you, John? Oh, very early. You know, uh, when a lot of kids were playing Cowboys and Indians, I cared about sports. And um, I have so many memories to, to share with you, but you were talking about it in the after. They played afternoon games then, a yes, lot of them. Yes, yes. And... Um, you would come home, and the first thing you had to do was find out the scores. Well, WHN, or WMGM, or they kept changing call letters, um, oh, same company, and they had a show called Today's Baseball from 7 to 7.30, and they would do two ball games in a half hour because they'd skip ahead. And, um, you know, you'd hear the, the crack of the bat. They had the sound effects. So uh, 
two outs and two on, and here's Robinson, and the pitch is <laughs> a line drive down the left field line. Anyway, that's, um, I remember that as a big part of my life, today's baseball. Mm -hmm. And years and years and years later, I met Marty Glickman, who did it, and uh, I got to New York, and I was at a Nets game away. They had gotten to the finals of the ABA, and I met Marty, and um, I told him how much I loved that show, and he said, well, we, we loved it too, but we had to give it up. They stopped playing afternoon games. So um, I always loved sports. Mm -hmm. and, um, did you play as a kid? Yeah, I, <laughs> I did nothing but. <laughs> you know, and in, in high school, I played football, basketball, and baseball. And in college, I played basketball. And even when I got on the air, um, where, wherever town I was in, you know, I'd find a team and I'd play. And I was playing when I got the MCA job and playing very well in a charity game, and the, there were a lot of baseball players on the team, and they said, you know, you're in shape. You're going to play all 40 minutes. <laughs> and um, I ripped up my knee, Aww. and I, I never was the same, so mm -hmm. then I went to mm -hmm. uh, tennis. But yes. I've always loved sports. And you love tennis, too. You played a lot of tennis. Yes. Okay. Um, you grew up in Manhattan? Yes. Where? Uh, nice area, uh, east side, uh, off Madison Avenue. Okay. As you're growing up in New York... Do your parents encourage you to do sports? Well, you know, one thing, Mark, um, when I decided at a, at a very, very early age I was going to be on the air. You did? At a very early age. And um, um, I had this conversation. You know the actress? I know you do. Rue McClanahan, she's passed on. But we had, um, were part of a theater group at, at Sardi's. And she said to me, um, I can't give you her response, um, but I can give you my response. She said, well, when did you know that you wanted to be on the air? And I said, you know, I was a little boy, and the radio was on, and I heard um, an announcer say, live from Hollywood, it's the Eddie Bracken Show. Okay, and then you'd hear this great music, and Eddie's special guests are... I didn't want to be Eddie Bracken. I wanted to be the guy who said that. And I knew then, as a little boy, I was going to be on the air. And when I got to my teens, I realized I wasn't going to be good enough to play pro ball. So that um, um, it's a combination of I, I wanted to do sports, but I just wanted to be on the air. I knew that's what I was going to do. So um, it didn't matter what anyone thought. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was what I was going to do. And, what happened is, after going through a few colleges, I was not a great student, um, I ended up at Columbia General Studies, and they had a class at NBC given by the NBC program director, a guy named Steve White. And so there were all these people, and we, our class was in a studio at WNBC. How great. How great. And let's say in that one area, you know, I was the Michael Jordan in that yes, class, yes, okay? Yes. And because I lived it, I was going to do it. I was living it in my mind, every disc jockey show, every whatever. And um, at the end of the class, this guy gave me an A plus and said, you're good enough to go out. Well, how do you go out? Well, you make up a tape, blah, blah, blah. And I did, and I got a job, and thank Where? God. In Wellsville, New York. Okay. And when do you become aware that you've got this gifted voice? Because one of the things that has distinguished you is that you're not only good at what you do, but you sound good. And that's, I don't know if you worked at it or whether it was, it's God-given. What is it? In that case, I think it's God-given. Lucky you. And I read uh, Eddie Fisher's autobiography, and um, he said, you know, it sounds immodest, but it wasn't. It was just true. He said, you know, I, I was always going to be a singer. As a little boy, I would open my mouth and this glorious sound would come out because he had a great voice. And um, coming over here, um, listening to music, um, I heard Victor Bone, who had, the, even other singers said he had the best voice, the best pipes, you know. And um, Victor Bone was in an elevator, running an elevator in the Paramount building. And uh, Perry Como comes into his elevator and he, he stopped the elevator and went into a song, because here's Perry Como. And Como thought he was great, and he said, uh, you're going to make me take up my 
my barbershop tools <laughs> again. You know, um, so without sounding immodest, yep. um, I had a, I had a deep voice when I was a little boy, mm -hmm. and the thing reason I remember that is that yeah, I remember people saying to me, "When are you going to grow up to your voice?" Interesting. And did you have? Your favorite announcers who did play-by-play -play Well, I, I did, Mark. But, you know, I, I believe that there are many talented people. They have different styles. Yes. Now, you know I love Mel Allen. Yes. And I got to meet and be very friendly with Mel yes. Allen. And we did shows together at MCA when the Yankees start getting good. And they could sell the time, so they sold all this. Um, but he's not the only one. I mean, I listened right. to every disc jockey. I thought... I thought WNEWAM, that was the end of the world. Uh -huh. To go there and, and be William B. or Dick Partridge or Bob Landers. It or wasn't whoever. only the sportscaster whom, whom you sort of appreciated. Right. I listened you to You appreciated everyone. them all. Everything. Okay. And I had in my, uh, I couldn't do their voices or else I'd be Rich Little, <laughs> but I could do the rhythm and the pace. So I had a talk show in Baltimore before MCA, and I would anchor the um, election coverage. And um, I did it the way I thought Cronkite would do it, with the rhythm and the pace. I didn't mm -hmm, do his voice, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. anyway. So I've had that um, little ability. And uh, but you begin that way, and then by hook or by crook, you get your own personality and your own way. And I obviously have a very unusual <laughs> personality. I don't sound like anyone else, which I think is a very good thing. I do too. At one point, you decide that you're going to make. Radio, your profession, but am I correct that you're always hoping to become a play-by-play -play announcer? Was that something you wanted? Absolutely. Okay. And I, I can tell you about that, too. Um, in Baltimore, um, the talk show that I was doing was general. It was like World War III, and you know, I just battled bigots every night. And that led to a television show. And uh, Metro Media had a radio station in town, but no TV. And Westinghouse had a TV station, but no radio, so I could cross. Where now, I couldn't cross. You know, I, I can't do any work for ESPN, for example, because CBS wouldn't allow it. Um, and so I did a, a television show, and I had a lot of big stars on. Uh, and Baltimore then had a nightclub, and whoever was starring there would come on the show. And uh, you know what? Didn't mean anything to me at all. And the biggest politicos, I mean, Spiro Agnew was a friend of mine, and um, came on, and it meant, it meant nothing to me. But when I had a chance to do play-by-play, uh, -play, uh, that really was, and sports. Mm -hmm. And so I knew I was going to do it. It took me a couple of years. Um, I, I did fill in on some bullet games and cold games, and uh, then I got the MCA job, and and uh, I'm, I'm proud of one thing for this business. That was 72. Right. Obviously, I was about four years old at the time. <laughs> and um, I, I haven't missed a paycheck in <laughs> 42 years in this business, which is, very which unusual, is pretty damn very tough. Very unusual. Very unusual. Yeah. yeah. How, but how is it you, you could never miss a single Yankee uh, broadcast? Well, you know, my, my dad would say, well, let's knock on wood, you know, so... <laughs> I'll knock on wood. And you know, I guess I have fairly good genes, and you know, I take care of myself, I guess. And, and then. You never had a cold? Oh, well, obviously. I'm human. And you went on the I'm air anyway. I'm mortal. But I mean, no matter what, um, I was really sick one game in Boston, but I, I persevered. And I was really sick at a few years ago at a game in New York. Mm -hmm. and, um, but I, I persevered and got through it. Now come to the style, your style. You, you do understand, and you're aware of it. There's nobody who calls a game of baseball like you do. And we've spoke to, spoken about it as well, but I want you to reflect. What's the philosophy behind it? What are you trying to do when you sit at a microphone at a, at a ball game? It's not simply telling your audience there's a ball hit the shortstop. Right. What's going on? Well, I think you know, one thing you hit on earlier, um, to this day, baseball is a radio sport. First of all, a lot of it's played in good weather in the summer, and people are taking a hike or lying around the pool. I used to think baseball crackling on a radio 
when I be at the ocean. Uh, I thought that was the greatest sound in the world. It just sounded great. Right. Okay. Right. So it's still a radio sport, and people can take you anywhere, and they don't have to sit in a room with a TV set. And now, because of technology, my goodness, which I don't understand, of course, people listen to us abroad. Right? It's, it's not difficult. And then with um, um, uh, baseball's package that's on your iPhone or your computer, and, and uh, the satellite radio that takes your games everywhere. I mean, people can listen everywhere, so it's a great age to be in radio. Now, Mark, just like I did the talk show at MCA or everything else in my life, I do it by the seat of my pants. So I don't sit by myself in a dark room and think, what am I going to do today? I love it when people say, well, how do you prepare for the game? How do I prepare for the game? By following baseball since I was five, you know. I mean, something about it. If I asked you, when was the first time you fell in love with baseball? I was in a car in Connecticut, and the World Series game was on radio. And I can't explain why. But from that day on, I just loved it. I just loved it. I, I can't. Anyway, um, so um, I don't, uh, that's how I prepare, by the way, because I followed it every single day for my whole life <laughs> and will and will till I die. Um, and, um, you, you know, I know you're asking, well, what, what do you want to do? Well, basically, you want to entertain your audience. So I want to do a little more than, you know, I, I kid people last year, the Yankees hit so badly, something that they admit, okay, I don't have to worry about, oh, my same thing at a school. You know, Brian Cashman says it, Hal Steinbrenner says it. You know, it's a ground ball to short. Really, it's not very exciting. So you be, better be ready. Now, in baseball, unlike the other sports, there is so much spare time that you have a chance to tell stories or sing a Broadway song or whatever, whatever it is you do. So Most announcers don't, though. Well, and you tell we're all stories. different. You, you tell stories. There's an arc to your game that is very different. And... Um, but there are some good announcers, don't get me wrong, but a lot of them are cookie cutter. You're not cutting any cookie, John. No. You know what I mean by that? Absolutely. Yeah. And by the way, you sometimes you take criticism for it. And, you know. Sometimes. I, <laughs> <laughs> and it, you know, it, it, it really, in my mind, is an enormous compliment to you because people understand that you're doing something totally different. And, John, you're beloved. You know, when I walk with you anywhere, I can't walk two steps. People are all over you. Well, I think that uh, everyone in life wants to be celebrated for their life's work. It doesn't matter what you do. But we're in a position where people know of us. Um, people recognize me when I have a sweatsuit on and dark glasses. I'm going out for coffee in the newspapers. And I'm, sometimes I'm thrown by that. And I will tell you this, uh, people have always treated me beautifully and with respect. And I'm very, very happy about that. So I, I do think that our broadcasts have g gone over and have been picked up. Of course. Um, and I was... I'm By the way, it's, in case you're wondering, it's 26 years now. Is it now? Yeah. Good for you. I called Bill White when he wrote a book, a terrific book. And... Um, he said to me, and we became friends when I got the MCA job, and I was doing pre and post, and I'd be up there all the time. And Bill White said to me, he said, you know, you've done the Yankee games longer than anyone. You have. And I said, well, but not, not Scooter. <laughs> you know, I'll never make Scooter. But that's a big kick that yeah, I've... But you've done more than Scooter. You've done it longer than Scooter. No, he was on for 40 years. Are you sure? Yeah. Right after he... I know how, because right after he... He did the smartest thing in the world. He got cut by the Yankees the day before September 1st so they could add Enos Slaughter to the postseason roster at the end of the 56th season. And we'd be so bitter that we'd say something. He didn't. And the next year he was on the broadcast. So he was on from 57 to the early 90s, I guess. Okay. But he was a color guy. Okay. You're the main play-by-play -play okay. guy. Okay. Um, also, there, I've been with you, and people don't recognize you, but they hear your voice. Right. And the moment they hear your voice, you're John Sterling. So. Right. 
and they love the voice and they love you and and that's an enormous testament to what you'll be able to create and so I said to myself are there ever moments when you say to yourself holy cow look at what I've been able to achieve because at one point I was this kid growing up in Manhattan right. with a dream and you've not only achieved the dream John you've been an announcing the Yankees for more than 25 years. And for, I said in the open, it's with more than a generation. What I mean by that is right. people of all ages now, when they think or hear in their ear the Yankees, they hear it in your voice. And what's that mean to you? Well, I don't think that you can um, think about this every day. Um, I will tell you this, what I am proud of is that I got a, first of all, this business is all luck. It's kismet and luck. Um, I think people can do the job. Now the question is, can you get the job? And um, the Yankees were going through announcers. They had no broadcast team. And a gentleman named Fred Winehouse became the general manager of WABC, and he listened to the broadcast, and he, he didn't like it and um, he was gonna make a change. So I walk into my Atlanta place and I get a phone call and from a producer at, at WABC, would you be interested in doing the Yankees? So I, I said, well, yeah, but I'm not giving up the Hawks. <laughs> and, uh, and I got the Yankee job without an audition. I didn't have an agent. I called a buddy of mine who you know of because of the Nets and Islanders, Mike D. Tommaso, who's sure. a lawyer, sure. and Mike called this guy, and they made a deal. That's how you got the job. Right. I didn't have to audition for the Yankee job. Now, someone wrote, it'll be two years and out, like all the rest of them, and uh, it's now been 26 years, and the guy has never written a retraction. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. And so when I, when I left, um, it was very tough. I loved Atlanta. I was single. I didn't have kids yet. And I had the best life you can have. And um, You also had been doing the Braves game. Yes. So you and were doing play-by-play. -play. Yes. Baseball. Yeah. And, um, and, and you I, also love basketball, don't you? Yeah. You I, love doing play-by-play -play basketball. Yeah. Yeah. But I loved <laughs> hockey and football, too. So yeah. um, when I... Um, left, I did so because, and this you'd appreciate, I didn't want to become an old man and say, I should have done the Yankees, you know? I didn't, so I took a big chance. And uh, it's obviously, you know, worked out better than I ever could have dreamt. Uh -huh. So who knows, who knows? So it's not, I do want to tell this to kids who want, they, kids ask me all the time, I want to do, be you and all. So I tell them, don't listen to no, um, because, you can do the job. Now the question is, can you get the job? That's a very tough thing. That's how I got the Yankee job, and it's worked. Okay. And how do you come up with the home run call? Was it calculated, or did one day it just come out of you? No, I, I do everything by the seat of my pants. It comes out of me. I can tell you this. You love this because you're a baseball guy. Um, there's a game, Atlanta, Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, the old one, was uh, really a football place. It had um, two levels, and, and the upper deck went all the way around the ballpark. It was a circuit, not a very good baseball ballpark, but it was, a cir it was circular, but it framed the home runs. And one day I'm on TV, and Dale Murphy is sitting, and Gooden hangs a breaking ball, and you could see it. And kind of like what Matt Adams did to Clayton Kershaw. You could see it, and you know, his eyes get big, right? And so Murphy swung, and because he, he's hit it, it the, the, the ball was framed by the stand, so you knew it was out. And that was the first time I ever said, it is high, it is far, it is gone, because you could see it. You knew it was a home run. And that's the first time I ever did that. And I had used people's names uh, in basketball, especially Dominique. You know, I'd say Dominique is magnifique and stuff like that. And um, so I guess with the Yankees, the first one I did it with was Bernie. Um, Bernie goes boom, or <laughs> burn baby burn. And, it be and as the Yankees got good, it became a thing. Now, 
it's become a cottage industry. Now I have to do it for every player, every and it was player. and it was never intended like that. Yes. So, um, and now you do have to actually figure it out. And don't you? people come because up to me in the winter time. What are you going to do for <laughs> whoever the Yankees pick, pick up? up right. What are you going to do for? And I would kid people last year. You know, people keep asking, you know, what are you going to do for so and so home run? And I'd say, what home runs? They don't hit any home runs. So, <laughs> so I hope they go back to hitting. 240 home runs and scoring 900 runs. That I'd love. Okay. But wait, talk for one moment about that 1998 season where you went to the ballpark. Is it, but isn't it easier as a play-by-play -play announcer when you're announcing a winning team? Oh, much. Much. You're giving the good news instead of the bad news. And, and no you, had, you had this extraordinary run under with Joe Torre where – John, I think you'll agree with me. It was a magic moment in baseball where you don't normally see a team that goes to the, the World Series six times and wins four times in, a, in, in the span of those years. Yeah, it was a great, it was a great one. 96 was the most fun year. Now, we were friends because he was the manager in Atlanta when I began. You were friends up with Joe Torre. Yeah. Yes. And so now a buddy of mine is getting to be the manager of the Yankees, and I'm a very optimistic human being, so I always think good things. And 96 was kind of a miracle year in, in a many, many ways. And um, in, in, in 98, I don't know how it happened. They had, what a team. We went 114, and uh, Michael Kay and I would look at each other, and we used to do like a two-minute little talk before the rest of the pregame. And um, when we'd look at each other, I, is this team ever going to lose? How, how, how can they keep winning all these games? And they won unbelievably, um, game after game. And they finally had a bad stretch. That, that team that was 114 and 48, imagine that. <laughs> they actually had a stretch when they were 12 and 14 or 14 and 16 or something like that in, in maybe mid-August to mid-September. Is it hard to come to the ballpark when the team is playing poorly? If it's over a long period of time. Well, I'll give you a quote from, um, from Lindsey Nelson, great Mets announcer. And uh, he was asked, especially in the first five, six years, of losing so much, what do you do? And Lindsey Nelson said, you make the game that day important. Mm -hmm. So um, the Yankees still had a chance to make the playoffs. Imagine, now you could say to me, John, which I have not had to do, if you had a team that was lousy for 20 years, what do you do then? Now that's, that would be tough. I haven't done that. When you and I were kids, the ethic of being a baseball announcer was not to be a homer. You were not supposed to be rooting for the team that you were announcing in New for. York. Was it only in New York? Yeah. Because I remember when I heard a game in Cincinnati, they were rooting... Out, you know, yeah. and the same First time, of Jerry all, Coleman wasn't for the New York Yankees. It, it really annoys me, um, except I throw everything away, so it doesn't really annoy me, that people think I'm a homer. I'm so honest. <laughs> I all know. I have to do is listen. That's a knock. Yes. That's a knock. Well, they'll bring it in. Now, that, it, all they're saying is uh, that I get very uh, excited or enthusiastic when the Yankees do something. Well, it's a team I'm selling, of course. Um, so, but in, in the Midwest, they allow that. You can say we and us. And by the way, Skip Carey used to say, boy, we're lousy today. Well, he's saying we, but he's being honest. Yes. So, Have you ever been given grief because of being too honest in a baseball broadcast? No, I don't think so. So do you feel pretty free to say as you believe? Yes. You don't worry that you're going to somehow... The Yankees well, will be upset. Well, first of all, one thing. If you said to me, well, John, do you say dumb things on the air? Of course. I'm, I'm uh, speaking extemporaneously for four hours every single day. So uh, believe me, I make my share of mistakes and say my, more than my share of dumb things. But you can't think about it. How are you going to think about it? Really. Um, that would make you Sam Straight Arrow, you know, mm -hmm. only give, you know, just the facts, ma'am. Well, you can't do that for three, four hours on radio. And, and, and baseball, you can in the other sports, but not in baseball because there's too much spare time, a lot of spare time. Yes. Um, now talk to me about steroids. And you lived through, as an announcer, the steroid era. 
Number one, John, did you know what was going on? No. How could that be? Uh, there were there were rumors. Uh, well, I mean, that would be easy. I don't. They, they would if they were doing steroids. They were doing them somewhere else. They weren't doing in full view of me. Um, but there was the, the one thing. But all I, of a sudden, they would just be they blow up. Right. Right. Uh, what did we think? Lenny Dykstra was the one. Um, he came back after winter and. And he looked like the Hulk. And he said, oh, I was just working out. But I think people kind of knew. And I was sitting with um, an Indians pitcher, really nice guy, from this area, from Connecticut, uh, Charles Nagy. And um, we were just sitting there, like on the tarp, his batting practice was going on. And he was <laughs> telling me, hey, you know, I'm on the mound, and here come these monsters, <laughs> one after the other. So, I mean, it, it was felt then that people were doing steroids. But baseball was having... Great success. Great success. And it was so, so much fun. Yeah, and so people just, you know, turned a, a blind eye or deaf ear away. So if you were voting... Well, I, I do want to tell you this. There are things that get me where, uh, like the thing that happened in Sayreville, or um, uh, Adrian Peterson whipping a child, um, really gets me. They're criminal. Sadistic criminal activity. The steroids, people are doing it to themselves. And if hitters are doing it, well, pitchers are doing it. So I was never one to say, oh my, he used steroids. I mean, I'm sorry, that's, it was a steroid era. And there was a cocaine era. You know, was it, uh, was it worse when players would get hammered every single night? Um, when they were playing day baseball, they're out in the bars. You're in St. Louis or Cincinnati or wherever you are, Chicago, wow. <laughs> and uh, you played a day game, and uh, they drank. Uh -huh. Probably smoked a lot and drank a lot. So, so if you were on the, uh, if you were one of those who voted on whether a ball player should be put in the Hall of Fame, oh, I'd put them all in the Hall of Fame. You would. Yeah. When they when you're at home plate, you're the only one there. When you're at the mound, you're the only one there. No one can help you. It's the most selfish sport, and um, uh, did bonds and. Um, Sosa and Rafael Palmero probably take steroids. Yeah, I would, I would guess. And did Roger? He might have. But uh, McGuire. Well, McGuire. Whatever. Well, all the names that you yes, can think of. Right. But I, uh, to me, would they all should it, be. You, they all should be. Yeah. I am so happy that you say that. Yeah. I know. I know. We may get some criticism. Well, I'm sorry. But no, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. And very often they were facing a pitcher who was on steroids. Right. The argument, incidentally, against this is that they made it an uneven playing field. Right. And that the ball players who didn't use steroids were at a serious disadvantage. And then, therefore, when you decide who should go into the Hall of Fame, it should be people who were, again, playing on the same. Pl Nobody has an advantage of a chemical nature. What do you say to that? Yeah, I'd say that they. First of all, they didn't take steroids their whole career. What I have against steroids is the fact that um, it may it may hurt you, it may kill you, and and it may, it may be stupid. Yeah, it may so, be stupid, right? Well, I mean that that really is. Well, we know it's going to hurt your right. kidneys, et cetera. Right. So, but I think it was the era, and um, for me, I would vote for them for the okay. Hall of Fame. Okay. So, all these got Barry Bonds in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, Barry Bonds was fabulous. <laughs> it's fabulous. I don't believe it was just steroids that did it. He was a pretty good player before. That's right. He got bigger, yeah. let's say. Also, I mean, one one other thing about if that was the case, why didn't other guys hit that way? They were taking steroids, you know. What about Pete Rose? Well, I think he served his time. Murderers have gotten out of jail <laughs> in this time. So I, and he has four thousand hits. And I would definitely put him in the Hall of I Fame. I would, too. I would, too. I don't know how that would be harming baseball. Yes. Um, so I want to know some of the moments that stand out in your mind. Mm -hmm. And you've, you know, it's not only baseball. You were there in the early days of Dr. J. You were announcing, it was the ABA, the Nets, and when I say he was revolutionizing basketball, this is before Michael Jordan. What he was doing on a basketball court was amazing. And you get to call it every yeah, night. Yeah, was, was it great. fun? Oh, was it was it great. Fun? It was great. And my best buddy was coaching. So I was this really is, wrapped in Kevin Locke. Right. 
So I want you to know I was at a big dinner a couple of years ago, and Doc was like right there in the first table. I think it was the Thurman Munson dinner. I think that's what it was. And I looked at him and said, Doc, hi. I said, hey. I said, you remember the old days of the Coliseum? Well, let's see. It was you and me and Kevin Lockery and Mike DiTomaso and about 15 other people. And he broke up. You know, he was the most exciting player on a terrific team. And we couldn't draw flies at the Nassau Coliseum. And um, I was there for the second championship, and it was... Boy, was, you made it sound like the place was packed. Yeah. It well, no, at the, at the end, yes. they finally did get big crowds. They finally got a Saturday night when they beat San Antonio to win the semifinals, and then Denver, I think in the last game, they probably had a sellout. Okay. And now going back to baseball, especially with the, the, the Yankees you've seen, I just want to know which of those, you know, are there games, are there moments where even though you're now, you're, this is your profession, it's your right. job. Your job is to come, and in some way, you have to both be in the moment, but you also have to be watching the moment. But are there, have there well, been Well, we moments? had it. We had one, Mark. Which one? <laughs> well, <laughs> Derek Jeter. I want to know. Um, Was it amazing? I can give you the end of the story, as you know, I sound like Paul Harvey. Um, <laughs> that's just, because it's so recent. Um, I know you know this. So the Yankees have a three-run lead. David Robertson comes on and gives up a solo home run and a two-run home run. <laughs> and now they're tied, and the Yankees get someone on and get someone to second base, and Derek Jeter is up in his last game at Yankee Stadium. And he bangs, as I used to call it. By the way, newspapers and I would say sportscasters on all sports things they use all these phrases and never give name credit. And I always give name credit. When I do a line from Bob Hope, I give Bob Hope name credit or so on. Um, but anyway, Jeter hit this Jeterian single to right field. He's only done about a billion times in his life. The winning run scores. The place goes obviously nuts. What a story of beginning. I mean, that's the, he never should have played in Boston. But he did it because he's a good guy. But that, that's the end of the movie right there. Gee, uh, what, a, what the end of a movie. And you know what got me? So many players from baseball and other sports tweeted in to say how phenomenal it was that the captain would do that in his last at bat. So I have um, my scorecard. By the way, I just want to say, yeah, because you know I called you after that call. Mm -hmm. And I heard that call done by many people. And again, you, you have to be a baseball fan to know what I'm saying. And John's talking about the last game that Derek Jeter played. I know many of you watching with Chaim, you don't know who Derek Jeter is. You couldn't care who Jerry. <laughs> but there are some of you who do. And your call of that hit to right field that won the game, it was a meaningless game. It meant nothing except for the fact that it was Derek Jeter's last game right. uh, in, a, in a storybook 20-year career. But that call was a brilliant call, and the reason I, and, and then you can talk about it. You're able to describe a play without, and I know people are going to, if you know John Sterling, you, not everybody will agree with me, you didn't overcall it. You let the call just arise out of this moment, and it was a perfect call. You didn't try to make it, it didn't need you to make it bigger than it was. Right. And some of the other people who did the call, you could tell they, were, they wanted to do something where they would be quoted. And all of a sudden, the hit was secondary. And you made the hit primary. And I was very impressed and very proud of you for that call. And that's also been well, something I want you done. to know something. I, I don't know what I sounded like because I do not listen to tape, ever. And, um, so it happened, and I, you know, line drive, base hit, uh, here comes Richardson, he scores, ball game, you know, that, that kind of thing. That also means something to you. The fan in you appreciates that as well as the announcer, correct? Well, I don't know how anyone couldn't appreciate that. I mean, it, it, how amazing is that? That's, that's really what it is, how amazing it is that he never would have gotten a bat. Robertson's a great relief pitcher, and he just the had one bad. The last thing you ever could imagine was that they would tie the score on the top of the night. Yeah. So in the Jewish world, there tends to be a preoccupation with Jews 
and even in sports and even in baseball, Jewish baseball fans look around and they say, well, you know, who have been the great Jewish ball players? And it begins with Hank Greenberg and then goes to Sandy Koufax. And I don't know if there's any, th those two stand alone. And then you have, you know, the Ron Bloombergs and the Ken Holtzmans and now you have the Ryan Brauns. And Al Rosen, who was playing for the Indians and then became an executive. As you also have just been experiencing baseball, when you hear the, you know, the, so the, the Jewish names that have played the game, are any of them, do any of them mean something to you? Are there any, does a Greenberg or a Koufax or a Rosen, do any of them have special meaning to you? And do you feel that, do you understand why in the Jewish world they become heroes, whether Sandy Koufax pitched on a, you know, took Yom Kippur off and wouldn't pitch right, on Yom right. Kippur, and, you know. Can I tell you a cute story about yes. that? Um, he was taking Yom Kippur off yes. in the first game of the Minnesota World Series in 65, and they started Don Drill. And Drysdale got banged around, and Alston came to the mound to take him out, and he said, uh, I bet you wish I was Jewish, too. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that great? It's a I, I saw the, did you see the Greenberg movie? Yes. That was great. Yes. That yeah, was great. Yes. Um, and, you know, when Sandy Koufax was at the height of his career, you know, someone said, well, he's the greatest Jewish athlete since David. <laughs> you know, so um, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's a great part of the story, you know, if they play and if they, but it'd be more important to me if I met them and they were really nice guys. Yes. Now, yes. Greenberg I met playing tennis. Now, he was, uh, I thought, an exceptional human being. Have you ever met Koufax? No. Very private person, I hear. Ron Bloomberg would be classified as an absolute buddy of mine. Really? Oh, absolutely. A fun guy. Yeah. Yeah. Terrific guy. So it's not just for 25, 26 years, because really, as long as I've known you, you have been doing something creative on the air. And the fact that you have been able to touch so many people in a way that makes, that thrills them and makes them feel better. And you, know, you talked about entertainment, and you are an entertainer, and that's what, is, that's what sports are. But you've done it extraordinarily well, and you've had this exceptional career, which is, you know, w and you have miles and miles still to go. I sure do. And at the same time, you've been an extraordinary friend to me, and I love you very, very much. Well, I'm and, always and gonna I, be a friend to you, <laughs> and always. I, and I wish you all the best. And, I, and this is what I have to give to you. Uh, we showed already that you played on the four corners. Mm -hmm. Other guys wore hats. You never wore a hat. You didn't like to wear hats. But still, I'm going to give you now. The four corners oh. went on. The four corners went on, by the way, to win a national championship. And I know that if you'd been able to play, you, you would have been. You would have been out there. I love but it. But you now have your own four corners. The reason hat. I don't wear hats is I look so ugly in them. <laughs> Uglier, I should say. And uh, but I'm going to try this. I hope this. That looks good, but I'm, I will treasure it and uh, your friendship as well. So uh, let's put it this way. I hope we're friends 40 more years. Okay? Well done. Thank you, John. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Wonderful. John Sterling, known to the entire baseball world as the voice of the New York Yankees, an extraordinary human being. I hope you've enjoyed meeting him here on L'Chaim. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'Chaim, my friends. To life. <laughs>
and please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.